Welcome to Fall into ETF Investing. On today's special episode, our panel of guest speakers will be discussing the dividend advantage and investing in artificial intelligence, boom or bust. Welcome to ETF Market Insights. I'm Erin Allen, and this is Danielle Nezel, and we're your hosts of ETF Market Insights. And today we're really excited to be kicking off our special edition, Fall into ETF Investing. Erin and I, we are out of our home offices. We're right here in studio together. We're also talking with experts in the industry. We're bringing everyone together to bring you, the do-it-yourself investor, a fantastic educational experience here at ETF Market Insights. We're all about providing DIY investors the tools they need to navigate these markets and manage their own investment portfolios. Just a reminder before we do get started that we're not providing you investment advice or investment recommendations today. As Danielle mentioned, our show is all about providing education for DIY investors. Our next session is all about dividend investing and why dividend ETFs make a lot of sense for do-it-yourself investors. Our host for today is Sejal Patel. She is the host of Strictly Money, and she is a personal finance enthusiast and also an advocate, advocate for women in investing. So Sejal, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Erin and Danielle, for having me back on the channel. Great to be here. Welcome, everyone. In this episode, we're going to talk about a very popular topic, dividend investing. It's become a go-to for a lot of do-it-yourself investors and for many good reasons. What's really made dividend investing accessible are exchange-traded funds. However, not all ETFs are created equal. We have two stellar experts who will break down how to analyze dividend ETFs and the different strategies they use in the market Plus, we'll discuss how these ETFs can fit into your overall investment game plan. I'm joined by Valerie Grimba, a true pro when it comes to ETFs. Valerie runs the Global ETF Sales and Strategy Team at RBC Capital Markets, and she also works closely with ETF issuers to help facilitate ETF trading and create markets for their ETF products. Chris Heeks also knows the ETF space inside and out, Chris is a portfolio manager for equity-based and derivative-based ETFs with BMO and brings more than 14 years of experience in the investment industry. Welcome both. Thank, Thank you, you for having us. Great so Valerie, you. I will start with you. Dividend investing is a very popular with investors. Why do you think that is? Maybe run through the benefits. It's really easy to see why the dividend style factor is quite popular, and it should be popular kind of throughout market cycles. And that's because of one key feature, and that is total return. So, you know, they kind of are this perfect intersection if you look at dividend, dividend paying companies, in that you get this nice equity feature. So you're participating in the market, you're hoping for that price appreciation, that capital gains upside. But then you also got this element that's a little bit fixed income like in nature, you're getting this regular stream of income. And then combined as a total package gives you this beautiful total return. And then the other thing I don't want to take light of is the compounding factor, mm -hmm. and it shouldn't be unappreciated. Uh, you know, if you look at S&P 500's return over the past 35 years, over half of that total return is due to dividends and reinvesting dividends along the way. So it's super powerful. And then the last thing I will mention is that they also can, depends, well, I think we'll get into some of this in, the, in this discussion, but it can lower overall risk this is intuitive. Mm -hmm. If you think about the companies out there that are paying dividends, they're usually in mature businesses, they have obviously got cash on hand, and they also usually have a lower market beta. Chris, Valerie touched on a lot of wonderful points and, and benefits, but I think a lot of investors are wondering whether holding dividend stocks makes sense today, because we are in a high inflationary environment, high interest rate environment, there's a lot of market volatility, so how have dividend performing companies or dividend companies, how have they performed? Well, I think it might prove to be, uh, first of all, great to be here, but I think it might prove to be a bit of a tale of two cities. You know, what's happened so far this year and what are we looking at going forward? You know, if you look at the start to 2023, you know, the NASDAQ is up 35%. So despite these pressures, 
Um, you know, the market has treaded higher. But, you know, as we move into fall, we're seeing that concern again. It's much more reminiscent uh, to me of 2022, which was when we initially saw those rate increases uh, go up substantially from essentially 0% interest rates to 5%. So we're seeing the pressure of that. You know, we're seeing this messaging of so-called, you know, higher for longer in terms of interest rates. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think, you know, and, and we'll get into it, I know, but when you're talking about investing in high quality dividend companies, I think that part's very important. Not all companies are made the same, uh, but uh, high quality dividend companies um, gonna offer that ability, yes, to, to pay, you know, an attractive dividend yield, but also to, you know, mitigate risk as we, you know, go into, go into fall with certainly um, a little bit more volatility in the backdrop. So, uh, so far this year, you know, dividend ETFs would have underperformed, would have been more of a growth story, more of a tech story. We remember AI earlier this year, but I think as it goes, as we move forward and, you know, start to look at turning the calendar into 2024, um, we're going to look at, I think, uh, fundamentals, you know, cash flow and sustainability being more important to the market. And that's where I think dividend uh, ETFs can play a role in portfolios. So, Chris, for those who are looking at dividend stocks, why do ETFs make sense? Well, there's there's a lot of reasons that, that ETFs can help. But, you know, in, in dividends, I think the number one thing is building out, you know, is it's kind of boring, but diversification. And, you know, if you look at our dividend ETFs at BMO, you know, in Canada, we've got 50 names, you know, in U.S. and internationally, you have 100 names. Um, ETFs can offer that ability to build a more diversified portfolio. You know, when you're looking at dividend-based investings, I think, you know, if you ask yourself, what's what's the risk inherent with dividends? Well, I think the risk is, you know, some companies will look attractive, meaning they may have a high dividend yield, but that may pose extra risk. Higher yield does not mean it's going to be a better investment. And so when you're looking at dividend uh, ETFs, um, you, you want to look for methodologies like BMO's methodology that does put a focus on not just dividend yields, but what's the fundamental strength, what's going to be the uh, ongoing ability of companies to maintain and hopefully grow that dividend over time. So a good dividend ETF can take that into account and build broadly diversified portfolios. You know, obviously, if you're just investing in one or two or three stocks, you know, your fortunes are very much tied to, to, to those outcomes. Um, building a diversified portfolio can, can offer you know, better overall you know, robustness in portfolios. And, and then ETFs give you those, you know, those other classic advantages of ETFs, the one ticket solution, uh, intraday liquidity uh, that can be traded during market hours, uh, transparency, low cost, you know, all the things we've kind of come to love with ETFs overall, you know, that also apply to dividend ETFs as well. So, Valerie, how many dividend ETFs are there in Canada? Yeah, by our count, there are just over 100 dividend ETFs in the Canadian marketplace alone. So it's quite saturated. We like to think of dividend ETFs in four different buckets. So we have dividend quality, dividend growers, high yield, and then also covered call products, which are written on top of dividend strategies. And what we've seen this year is, is a bias towards the home team. So we are seeing a lot of buying of Canadian dividend ETFs. And we've also seen a, a lot of uh, interest in covered call strategies as well. Okay. Then from a market maker perspective, um, what are you seeing in that space? And I should probably clarify for those who don't know what a market maker is. It, they play a very important role to ensure that there is efficiency in the market and um, liquidity as well. Yeah, exactly. So we're out there every day uh, posting both bids and offers and then also help, uh, you know, the key kind of functionality of ETFs is the kind of create redeem uh, ability. And so we're out there trying to facilitate that, facilitate those tight spreads and kind of the tradeability and the liquidity of of ETFs. And um, so, yeah, so kind of what we've seen so far this year, again, is kind of this bias towards quality. Uh, Chris touched on this earlier. You know, dividends as a, as a factor, as a style, have underperformed a little bit, um, especially if you benchmark it against the U.S. names because it's kind of had a growth bias. Uh, but uh, like I said earlier, there has been a lot of interest in Canadian dividend ETFs. And I think, again, that's just kind of showing investors now are positioning towards kind of what is likely going to be an uncertain 2024. There's lots of talk. Is it soft landing, hard landing, bumpy mm -hmm. landing? Um, kind of the consensus on our desk as we talk to people is that they're 
isn't a consensus. And so I think people are kind of thinking a little bit more defensively and are trying to position that way. So if I'm thinking about my tactical Canadian allocation, maybe I want to have a quality dividend tilt to that for this time. So Chris, lots of ETFs, as Valerie explained, and, and different types of ETFs. What are some of the considerations investors need to make before buying a dividend ETF? Well, I, uh, you know, look under the hood, do your due diligence. Always these, you know, things are, are very, um, you know, very important. So, you know, to me, the number one thing, again, is is the um, if you're buying it with the expectation of lower risk. And I think that's a good way to look at it. Blue chip companies should be more mature, more stable. Um, just take a look at that methodology and make sure, you know, you're comfortable with it. I think, Valerie, that, that way of like, the, you know, decomposing it into just higher yield versus ones that look more at the quality or the fundamental strength. Um, that's a good one because, you know, what what you wouldn't want to do is go to a high yielding dividend ETF thinking that's a safe play when actually you might be getting exposed to more risky companies. Um, so, you know, if, if part of the, you know, thesis, if you will, of buying a dividend ETF is that we're late in the cycle, we're looking at a, a landing of some kind, um, most likely, right? Or there is the no landing, yeah. but what's called a landing of some kind, and you want to be defensive. Look at that methodology, and um, and so that's you know that's one thing you can look at. And and the other thing you know I, I think about is um, you know as an as an investor, you know, look at the company and, and ask yourself who you know who can you trust as a company to you know give you the help you need, the resources and the support. Who's invested in the Canadian market? Right. Um, and you know, BMO's always had a great advantage, in my opinion, in being we're, we're Canadian made and we're made for Canadian investors. So, so that's another thing I think you can ask yourself when you're doing due diligence is who's going to support you. And of course, we want to be doing that at BMO. And if we're not, we certainly want to hear about it. So, and if I could just add to that, Chris, mm -hmm. you know, we just talked about there's a hundred plus dividend ETFs in Canada. It is so important to do that research. Look under the hood. I encourage everyone that we speak to to look at the holdings list. Understand what you're buying. You know, if you're looking down a list of 100 ETFs and you're kind of sorting by highest yield, mm -hmm. there are a lot of reasons why you maybe shouldn't just jump to that top name on the list that's, that's showing this high yield number. Right. And we won't get into the financial math behind that, but this could be signs of distress right. or, or companies that are maybe a little bit more unstable. And then the other point I would mention is kind of, again, understanding the nuances around the terms dividend quality, dividend growers. Uh, on a lot of dividend growers lists, you will see companies like Microsoft and Apple. These aren't traditionally thought of when you're thinking of dividend paying companies, but they have stable dividends that they are growing year after year after year. So they kind of belong on this dividend growers list. And it's not just boring kind of traditional companies that we think of like utilities uh, in the kind of the holdings list. So definitely do your research. Makes so much sense. So when you're picking an ETF, a dividend ETF, that's one thing. Making sure that it fits into your overall portfolio is, is something else. So Valerie, what are some of the things that investors have to think about? Yes, absolutely. So we like to think that the dividend factor can kind of belong in any portfolio and can be used as a core holding, a core strategy, something, again, as you're thinking about risk profiles and kind of income generated that investors and advisors can kind of allocate in a certain amount to this dividend style. We also think dividend style can be used as a tactical bend as well. We talked about this earlier. We're kind of going into this period of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. People aren't quite sure what 2024 is going to look like. The RBC capital markets view is that we're kind of looking into a period of low economic growth. So kind of how do you move puzzle pieces around the edges of your portfolio with yeah. a tactical tilt? And maybe going into 2024, we might want to consider adding a dividend strategy for that consistent income and kind of the more stable cash flows and the lower market beta that dividend paying companies are known for. Speaking of strategies, uh, Chris, uh, what is BMO's dividend approach? And why is it important to emphasize sustainability and growth when you're looking at strategies? Yeah, for sure. So there's, there's a couple key points to what we look for in our dividend ETFs. Uh, the first one is we'll look at the three-year track record of growing dividends. And in particular, we're looking for companies that are growing their dividend or maintaining the dividend 
We're not looking for dividend cutters or uh, non-dividend payers, which which seems pretty straightforward. Uh, but you know the reason why is again it goes back to return and risk, and and uh, companies that are growing their dividends and maintaining it adequate, adequately tend to have a better risk-adjusted return than companies who have cut the dividend or even companies that aren't paying a dividend. Um, those companies. Um, can have more risk associated with them. So that's number one. You have to be paying a dividend. You have to be growing it or maintaining it. Um, but again, um, then the second big component I'd say is looking at the sustainability of that dividend. Mm -hmm. And that's where you got to go under the hood and start looking at uh, looking at the company fundamentals and looking at what analysts think about the company in terms of the forward-looking uh, fundamentals. So, um, you know, you can find all this information on our website, can't go into, you know, every number, but we're looking at um, how much uh, dividends are you paying versus how much cash flow are you generating? And so on both a historical and a forward looking basis. And so as an example, if a company is generating $100 uh, of earnings and, and paying out $50 as a dividend, you know, much like the Canadian banks, so we're at a 50% payout ratio, that's just fine, that's sustainable, right? If a company is generating $100, they're paying out 120, you know, that's not sustainable and they might be able to do it for a time, but eventually they're going to have to cut the dividend. And it's probably saying there's something risky with that company. So um, for us, and I, I think where you can really harness the benefits of dividends overall is, again, being in these more sustainable, high quality dividend payers. And, and you have to go look under the hood. So that's those are kind of the two big uh, screens that will narrow down our investing universe. And then our weighting factor is on total dividends. And total dividends is uh, our dividend yield of a company times a market cap. And that's the total dividends that the company is paying out. So we get a tilt towards higher dividend paying uh, stocks. Mm -hmm. We also get a tilt towards bigger, more blue chip, more kind of larger uh, companies. And so in our methodology, that's where a Microsoft or an Apple can make the portfolio because although the dividend yields 2%, it's a larger company, it's more stable, and it can make the portfolio based on that. So uh, we do have that tilt towards higher dividend yield, but we also have a tilt towards liquidity and large cap and kind of that blue chip aspect that we really think, you know, most clients when they go into dividend ETFs is what they're looking after. And so that's, you know, that's that's kind of our, you know, that's our construction in a nutshell and, you know, really just designing to get the best overall client experience. You know, everyone wants income, but we want to mm. we want to do, you know, have a sustainable to your point total return uh, track record at the end of it as well. And I also would just add to is that Christy did a great job of really simplifying that. But I would highlight there's so much nuance that goes into this and goes into that kind of stock selection. What is the basket? What is the ETF holding? And there are just so many levels to this. You really need to kind of pay attention and make sure you're investing with a team that you trust. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Valerie, Chris, I want to thank you so much for your insights today. I certainly learned a lot and I'm sure our viewers did as well. Well, that covers off our session. I'd like to thank BMO ETFs for continuing to host these educational segments for do-it-yourself investors and helping them become better informed. Have a great day. Our next session is all about investing in the next big growth trend in the stock market artificial intelligence. This has been a huge buzzword for investors, but we're going to break down, is this going to be the next investing boom or will it be an investing bust? Very exciting today. Danielle is actually going to be joining the panel. So looking forward to that. I'm going to turn it over to our special guest host for today, Marissa Roberto. Marissa, you may recognize from TSN. She talks a lot about sports and gaming. She's also an avid ETF investor. So Marissa, take it away. Welcome to ETF Market Insights. I'm Marissa Roberto, and usually I'm covering sports and esports for TSN, but I am excited today to get to shift my focus to covering the world of ETFs and capital markets. There are a bunch of similarities covering sports and the stock market. We've got winners and losers, investors making bets on who the next winners will be, and a lot of predicting going on, like which players will become the next big story rather than the next big bust. Today, we're going to explore if investing in artificial intelligence is going to be the next winner from an investment perspective, because AI is transforming the way we work, our social habits, and how we interact with the world. But will it transform the investment arena? With me today, we have Daniel Nuzzel from BMO ETFs and Ren Leggy from ARK Invest to help us understand and answer the question, will AI become the tech industry's next big boom or 
next big bust. First of all, welcome, both of you. Great to be here. Thanks, Marissa. Great to be here. Yeah. So excited to be here and doing this with you both. Ren, can I call you Renato? You may. Nice. Love this for us. Your team recently published a research report about investment opportunities in AI. Your opening statement is this. Artificial intelligence is reshaping industries, and we believe it could be a long-term growth driver more impactful than the internet. Pardon me? What? How? I want to start here because that's a huge statement to make. Explain yourself. Absolutely. So we think it could be magnitudes larger than the internet. If you think about the internet, over the last 20 years, it's created roughly $20 trillion worth of market cap yeah. and appreciation. Uh, we think AI will create $100 trillion over the next less than seven years. So by 2030, we think the enterprise value and market cap associated with AI companies could exceed $100 trillion. You're scaring me a little bit. It's a little exciting. Those numbers are huge. There will be winners and there will be losers. So <laughs> it's careful. You have to, to really focus on who those select winners mm. will be. So that's going to be the most important part of this. We have a call back to the intro. I have another question for you because some investors think, well, if I own an S&P 500 ETF or a NASDAQ ETF, I have lots of exposure to AI growth, but your team doesn't necessarily view the mega cap tech players such as Apple, Google, Meta as the future beneficiaries of growth in AI. So what companies are best positioned to participate in potential exponential growth? Well, on the surface, you're right. Everyone is thinking Google, NVIDIA, these are going to be the winners in AI. Yeah. But right now, they make up more than half of the NASDAQ 100. So chances are you already have a lot of exposure to that. Yeah. And what people aren't realizing is that ChatGPT, for instance, mm. that could be very disruptive for even Google or even Apple. Uh, so if you think about, you know, with Google, it's all about search advertising dollars. Yeah. So these are, these are very sustainable companies. But if I'm using ChatGPT to um, actually, now that there's real-time plugins, mm. you can um, get real-time information. It'll take you into that consumer's website immediately. So there's no need for Google anymore, right? So Google search could be pretty, you know, I don't know about you, yeah. I am starting to use Google much less now because I can have a, a plugin that can get yeah. me to the best travel site, wherever, without even needing, um, you know, to, to spend time on Google. And that's going to hurt them long-term. Ooh, I didn't even think about that. Also TikTok, big issues with that, right? Every time I'm on TikTok, I can just use it as a search engine. They're just, they're ruining it. Ruining it for everyone. It's okay. It's fine. It might be helping us. Danielle, I haven't forgot about you. I swear. I want to know why investors should be considering using ETF for exposure in growth in the AI space. Well, Ren kind of hit on it. So mm. investors don't know right now who are going to be the big winners in artificial intelligence five, 10 years down the road. Mm. And with an ETF, you get a basket of companies. So you're eliminating that single stock risk and you're diversifying amongst 40, 50 different companies that are all exposed to artificial intelligence. Okay. Now, I like to use the internet as an example when we talk about this and eliminating single stock risk. Okay. Because 20 years ago, if you were an investor and you made a bet on the internet being the next big growth opportunity, yeah. you had it right. You had it right. Um, the internet was the next big, big growth opportunity. We're all seeing that now 20 years later. But if you were trying to pick a company and pick a stock, that would have been very, very difficult to mm. do. So if actually we look back to the end of 1999, rewind the clocks a little bit, the biggest companies in the world by market cap who were kind of experiencing growth from this internet kind of boom at the mm. time were companies we might not even think about anymore. A company called Lucent Technologies, a company called Intel, we know Intel. Okay, yeah. Um, Nokia, I think right. we all remember our, our Nokia phones. Yes. Nokia, I don't even know if they're making phones anymore. We all know the winners in that space was Apple. Mm -hmm. Microsoft mm -hmm. was a winner. They've carried through 20 years later. Yeah. Fast forward the clock, who are the winners in the internet space? Uh, Facebook, Meta, formerly Facebook, yeah. Google, Apple, mm -hmm. you know, we know these names. So you can get the trend right, Marissa, mm -hmm. um, but to pick the actual company is a lot more difficult to do. So we find ETFs just a great way for investors to say, hey, I want exposure to something like artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. but I'm going to leave it to the professionals to uh, pick the stocks and keep an eye on, on which companies are really, really, truly exposed to that trend. Mm -hmm. I have to say, just shut up, Danielle. I trust her implicitly, okay, with this stuff. She was the one that got me on to ETS in the first place, and I have been singing her praises ever since. So just a little tire pump for Danielle. 
<laughs> Thanks, <Right>. Marissa. <laughs> Anytime. I have, one more, I have one more for you. What is the difference between an active ETF and a passive ETF? And why is this important in consideration when looking at ETFs for AI exposure? Absolutely. So great question, because a lot of investors who are starting out uh, using ETFs, they think about ETFs as a passive investment structure. So when we say passive, we mean the ETF tracks an index. Mm. So something like the S&P 500 that you mentioned or the NASDAQ 100, and that ETF will go out and buy the stocks in that index, mm -hmm. and that's it. And we're usually looking at kind of large cap companies um, that, are, that are kind of involved in these, these major indexes. Mm. So that's the passive structure. We think about active management. This was historically kind of kept in the mutual fund world, mm. uh, but now we're bringing it over to the ETF space. And this is where you get a team of analysts and portfolio managers mm. who are trying to pick the best stocks in a specific arena, mm. whether it's in US equities or global equities or, or what have you. But if we now take it back and look at getting access to artificial intelligence, yeah. you have a team of experts who are actively managing a portfolio, mm. researching the companies, understanding are they investing uh, meaningful dollars in research and development? Are they creating patents? Are they investing in things that are going to be the drivers mm. of future growth? And that's really hard for investors at, at home to do. And you know, that's why teams like REN at ARC, mm. they're such specialists in active managing uh, themes like artificial intelligence. Right, okay, I'm gonna turn it back to you, Ren, actually. It's your turn under the hot seat. Your team at ARC was one of the first in the industry to start looking at companies differently. Instead of looking at sectors, you look at companies exposed directly to an innovation. How has your team analyzing these stocks just looked at them differently than most? And how do you identify value in an AI company? It's gotta be tough. Yes, so we, we started with uh, structuring our team and our research process much differently than Wall Street, right? Mm -hmm. So when you're thinking about innovation, you're thinking about five years plus. Mm -hmm. And so if you're thinking about sectors or industries, you need to be focused on technology and how these technologies are going to disrupt those existing industries. There's, you know, there's a number of industries that we can't even think of right now mm. that are going to be built on top of AI. So it's all about structuring our team and we're hiring analysts that have domain expertise in the underlying technologies that we're researching mm. so that they can understand technology, how that's coming in and affecting that sector, and then look for those uh, companies that are best positioned to be either the key enabler or the beneficiary of these new technologies. And when we're looking at AI yeah. specifically, there's three things we're looking for. We want to find companies that have visionary leaders. Mm -hmm. They have a great management team in place that are thinking that five years out uh, or more. In some cases, um, they have distribution, you know, TikTok. You know, how did TikTok. that go viral? I mean, you have that distribution. You can push it out there. And that is the key to that is data, right? Mm -hmm. The more distribution you have, that network, network effect, mm -hmm. the more data you can collect. Uh, and then the third is is pushing is the quality of that data, right? right? So if you're collecting all that data and you have a superior product, you can build on top of that, then you can distribute it out. That's what set you so apart in the mm. AI world. Well, one of your highest conviction names in the AI software space is a company called Twilio. So can you tell us why this company was so exciting to you? Yes, so you use Uber? I do. So you know how you're messaging your Uber driver, I'm right here, but you can't find yes. me. All that is happening on the Twilio network. Okay. So they are using basically, tr there's trillion transactions almost, you know, in their entire database, <laughs> a billion or so per day. And that data is, you know, you're collecting information on all of their, they have clients, pretty much most of the Fortune 500 companies. Mm. So they're collecting data on all of these companies. Uh, and so with that data, you can essentially provide better services uh, and products that they can then sell. So that's a pretty big opportunity. And the big yeah. thing about Twilio is no one's really paying attention to that because they're all focused on NVIDIA. That's the AI name, yes. but this is AI software that we think is an even bigger opportunity and it's trading at a fraction of the, the price to sales ratio as something like NVIDIA. So. Flying under the radar, yeah. but could be a very big opportunity in the next few years. Well, one company that's definitely not flying under the radar in any way is Tesla. And that is one of ARC's highest conviction holdings. So your team doesn't necessarily view Tesla as an auto company, but they view them as an AI company, right? Or software company. Why is this? That's correct. So we have three analysts covering that stock, right? So you're typically Wall Street looks at it as an automotive company. Mm -hmm. 
is so far from that, right? Mm. Yes, they may be producing automobiles, but we think longer term they could be um, running a robo taxi network. That is that is built on AI. So we have an energy storage battery technology analyst. These are EVs, right? So electrical engineering. This is not mechanical engineering. We have a um, autonomous mobility analyst mm. covering it from the robo taxi network. And then we have an AI hardware and software analyst covering it from that perspective because they have their own full self-driving chip, which mm. is collecting all the data. So if you think about the data that they're collecting on the road, so there's several million Teslas on the road, they're collecting uh, billions of miles. Oh and when you look at Waymo, Google Waymo, mm. or even uh, cruise automation that are working on autonomous vehicles, mm. they're collecting their entire database, Tesla collects in a single day. So from an AI, I mentioned quality of data and the amount of data is going to be key here. So Tesla has the most data on real, real world driving. Uh, oh, dang, that's a tongue twister. Yeah. <laughs> Real world driving. Okay, say that 10 times fast. You can't. <laughs> so they have the most, the most uh, miles out there, and we think that's going to you know, put them ahead. And so it transforms <sighs> Tesla from a one-time vehicle sale, low margin business, yeah. to a reoccurring software as a service business mm. uh, with high margins. You know, Renato, I like you a lot, okay? You got a lot going on in that brain. I need to know how Canadian investors can access ARC Investment. What, how do we do this, Danielle? Yeah, well, it's really exciting. So ARC and BMO ETFs have collaborated to bring ARC's ETF and their strategies up here to Canadian investors. Mm -hmm. And this is really important to note because a lot of Canadian investors sometimes buy ETFs that are listed in the U.S., but it's not always the best investment experience for a Canadian investor to do that. You're buying a, a U.S. domiciled asset. For, so as a Canadian, it's it's not a, a Canadian asset. Mm -hmm. And they're usually trading in U.S. dollars. So you have to kind of navigate a currency exchange there when you're okay. buying and selling. So kind of to streamline this approach for Canadian investors, uh, BMO ETFs has listed three of ARK's ETFs up here in Canada, mm. uh, the same ticker names, ARKK, ARKW, and ARKG. Um, but, th but these are accessible to Canadians. They trade in Canadian dollars, and it's a Canadian domiciled asset. So just a better investor experience for a Canadian. So where do these strategies belong in a portfolio? Yeah, we. so this is, the, this is growth investing, mm. I, I would say at its finest, because we're really looking at companies like, like for example, Twilio at Renset is, is mm. trading really under the radar. We're looking for companies that have opportunity to really have exponential growth, mm. which is exciting for investors, right? Because everybody wants to grow their portfolio as much as possible. But sometimes investors don't think about the other side of the equation when managing a portfolio. And that's you're also managing risk as well. Mm. So big reminder, when you are investing in AI companies, these tend to be small, mid-cap companies. There's going to be more volatility. And as Ren's team works through which companies are going to be the going to be the best winners and losers, there might be a couple losers in there, and those will be taken out of out of the portfolio and new winners will be added uh, as you analyze. But I think the, the point really to make is there is going to be some volatility mm. uh, in this type of portfolio. So we really call it out for a part of a growth sleeve within a, a broader, more diversified portfolio to really juice up the growth, the growth side of the portfolio. And again, the time horizon on these, as Ren mentioned, mm. you're looking at five, 10 years down the road and sometimes even longer. If we mm. look back to the internet boom. It took about 5, 10, 15 years for the maturation of those companies to really hit the market and yeah. those types of companies to get to that trillion dollar market cap. So something to set in your portfolio mm. and not expect it to you know, shoot to the moon in a year, <laughs> but keep keep it in a growth sleeve. And, re and remember, there is a time horizon on that five, 10 years and I be patient with remember. it. I love that you're saying remember, but I love to set and forget. <laughs> with my ETFs, just put them aside and let them have some fun. And that's and the best mandate. And, that, and let Ren's yeah. team manage the portfolio for you and just set it and forget it. Love this for us. As a reminder to investors watching at home, those ARC ETFs are listed right here in Canada by BMO ETFs. 
They are listed in Canadian dollars on the Canadian exchange, which creates a better investment experience for Canadians. To find out more, visit arcinvest.com or bmo.com slash ETFs. Danielle and Renato, this has been a pleasure. So much fun. Thank you so much for your time and your insights. Thanks. Great to be here. It was a great conversation. I agree. This was fun. Let's do it again. Thanks for joining us. Well, that is a wrap on 2023 fall into ETFs. Thank you so much for joining us. It was a lot of fun. And again, to get the energy from all our speakers today in person and provide fantastic insights for investors at home. What a great couple of weeks. If you haven't already, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel, ETF Market Insights. We'll see you next week.